This film is not suitable for children. It contains verbal descriptions of extreme cruelty, including human trafficking, torture, and the commercial sexual exploitation of young children. Could you do that to me? <sighs> How could any adult ever do that to any child. I know you were abused as a child, but it's not an excuse. I was abused as a child and I never abused a child. I never would. to me when I can remember having all sex with you. How could any mother do the things you did? I want to have the kind of mother I am. I deserve to have the kind of mother I am. Mothers and Molestation, a film about child abuse. There are many protective mothers. Did you have a good mother? I had a great mom. Uh, she was an artist and she always supported me in my own art. She came to all of my dance recitals, all of my band recitals, um, shows. Um, anything that I wanted to pursue, she supported it fully. Yesterday when I was at work, she just gave me a call and was like, hey, they gave me an extra pizza, do you want one? <laughs> and so I was just like, oh yeah, I'm on my lunch break right now. I gave her like a big hug because then I didn't really bring anything to eat to work that day. I had a great mother. She was pretty much my best friend. Not the best friend who lets you get away with everything, but the best friend who cares so much about you that I could go to her about anything. What's your relationship like with her now? The same. I talk to her every day. If we go a few days without talking, we think something's wrong with the other one. <laughs> so literally we check in every day. That was the part that took the most for therapy is because it wasn't even the sense that my mom would ever like physically or mentally abuse me is that she let somebody else that she, she was with do that. I had made it aware to her that I wasn't comfortable being around my godfather and she didn't do anything about it. There are mothers who do not protect their children. There are even mothers who are molesters. People want to pretend there's no such thing as a bad mother, so no one knows what to do about it when there is. What if I ask this question, was your mother protective of you? No, never, ever. Was your mother protective of you? Yes. <laughs> Too protective? <laughs> I'm only answering Mary's question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very protective. So let's talk about moms. What was she like as a mom? I guess when I think about it, the first things that comes to my mind is just that you were always there. So like when I think about my child, you know, when I think about my child, it's just like I think of mom. We were super close, still pretty close. I could always go and talk to her. So it was always kind of a, a place of support and like my safe place, like my touchstone. You know, I'd go out and do stuff and then when things got hard, I could always call you. Mm -hmm. I still can, I still do, mm -hmm. yeah. 
And what was your mother like? As a mother. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, uh, I've never, I never felt any love for her or really from her either way. She's an extreme narcissist. I mean, she's, it's all about her and it's always, always been about her. So it was never about me or what I needed or what I wanted. And, uh, you know, I, there she has a, a, a cruelty to her that is pretty unmatched. I mean, just she's pretty horrible. And the thing that also supports that actually was your interview with my grandmother when she discounts child abuse, yeah. where she says it's like not a thing. We have to help each other and forgive and understand and have empathy and not carry grudges forever and ever. Generational, one generation after the other. Hates, hates, hates. He touched me. Oh my God, he touched me. And therefore he touched me and he's dead. He's dead. And so even if him. there was the incestuous touch, you think the family should I don't still know what together. incestuous touch is. I well, mean, it requires touch, if somebody you know. comes into your bedroom and forces himself on you, that's one thing. If he, if he, what if, what if what? I had an uncle, my sister says, used to uh, fondle her. Yeah, he'd hold a newspaper like this and he'd fondle her. Okay, he's dead. Don't ever speak to him again, he's dead. He made a terrible mistake. So even fondling, you think? Say, get out of here, Uncle Irving. Leave me alone and walk so away. So you think the little kid should be responsible for these I think at a certain point, if he's uncomfortable, they should speak up for themselves and be responsible for themselves, not carry a grudge from century to century. But if there was sexual touch, do you think the family should still stay together? Of course. Even if there was Absolutely, sexual. yes. I don't think that, I don't think sexual touch is the horror of all horrors. I don't think so. I think we make a big to-do about nothing. We know child abuse has a long-lasting impact. Adverse childhood experiences are traumatic events that happen between infancy and age 18. From 1995 to 1997, Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control conducted the first adverse childhood experiences study. It followed over 17,000 Kaiser patients. Medical records were examined and participants were asked if as a child they had been abused, neglected, or exposed to a family dysfunction such as domestic violence, mental illness, or alcoholism. The results were astounding. Compared to someone with no adverse childhood experiences, participants with four experiences were 12 times more likely to attempt suicide seven times more likely to be alcoholics, and twice as likely to have cancer. The ACEs study also shows just how, met, how much child abuse there is. I don't think they were planning on finding that. Mm -hmm. And they just were shocked at just how common yeah. it is. So that was really helpful for them just to have a baseline in our country of like yeah. how much child abuse. Yeah. We don't That's what was shocking. Children well. According to the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, one in four women and one in six men were sexually abused as children. You were severely abused as a child. Were you? No. So yeah. the cycle can break? But I had a lot of help. As we see, the cycle of abuse often does not break. And thinking about what it takes to have somebody recognize that, like, wait a minute, this isn't the way that love should be. Like, wait, there's something else. Mm -hmm. There's another way to do this. And some people have that inside of them and like that wisdom, that call. I don't know what it is, that inner sense of this isn't right. And so to have somebody like my mom who has the strength to say, no, like this isn't, I'm going to do the terrifying thing and get help and do something that I've never done before. That just blows my mind. It's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Survivors that can do that. What does recovery mean to you? Well, first you take that because you're the, <laughs> you'll have a lot to say. But um, I, I think everybody finds their own way, and I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. And I don't. And I think that it's a, an illusion to think that we'll ever be fully recovered or cured or any of that. That's not. That's not reality. We're we're always, in my experience, dealing with some level of this. But we can continue to feel better in our lives. We continue to have rich lives. We can still 
have good relationships, um, meaningful relationships, meaningful careers. I mean, all of that is definitely possible. From my own experience, and then from both working as a chiropractor and a mental health provider, what I've noticed with people that have trauma is that experience has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the people that tend to show it more, the, the symptoms are going to show up, whether they show up more psychologically and emotionally and behaviorally, or whether they show up more physically in terms of diseases and autoimmune diseases and so forth, it has to show up somewhere, or chronic pain mm -hmm. um, that even doesn't have a diagnosis, that's right. So it's, it's that, you know, so what I tell clients is the more you address, you know, that we have a lot of physical symptoms, the more they can tap into and are willing to look at some of the trauma, the emotional trauma, the less physical symptoms they tend to have, mm -hmm. and vice versa. I think the one important piece is finding connection to other humans in some way. Mm -hmm. A therapist can be that person to help kind of facilitate that, but also more than that, like having actual natural supports, finding those people that believe you and mm -hmm. um, can, because it's in relationship that we're wounded. And so through relationship, we heal. I went to Star Lake Elementary School. I had a speech teacher that helped me so much. My speech therapy problems were severe, but the main way she helped me was by loving me. I had speech therapy in first grade, second grade, and third grade. And by third grade, most of the other kids didn't need speech therapy. So it was just me and the speech therapist and one other child. Sometimes just me and her. She wore super old fashioned shoes. And some of the kids teased about it, but it didn't matter because she loved me. I have a picture of me when I was three. I'm sitting on the table that we sat at. When that lady was over, I sat on the woman's lap and I asked her if I could come home with her. She thought I was joking, but I wasn't. And at the end of the evening, you took me out of her arms. I cried and screamed and sobbed. He said, quit crying. She's gonna think we're bad parents. I always have remembered how heartbroken I was. I really wanted to go home with her, all the abuse I would have missed in my life had I gotten to go home with her. I'm in awe of that little girl who at age three was wise enough to know there was a better mother for me out there. We were out in the country and I would walk to a neighbor's house to eat breakfast every weekday morning. And this was before I started kindergarten. Wow, she's got goosebumps. This is Mrs. Brown's house. I was always safe when I was with her. I'd walk to her house and eat breakfast, and she made what she called mush, but it's oatmeal, salty oatmeal. To this day, I love salty oatmeal. She cooked the oatmeal overnight on this wood-burning stove. She'd have homemade bread with it. Maybe that's one reason I like to make homemade bread now. I just remember feeling so cherished, so safe, so loved when I was with her. Did you have anyone like that? I didn't have a specific person, I would say, but I always did pretty well in school, so I think I you know, had teachers that liked me. I stayed in a really abusive home, but I grew up to be the person I am now. I have a happy life, and it's because of some of these childhood heroes. I did. They weren't people. They were people I read about in books. Like my, my hero was Nancy Drew because <laughs> she had a wonderful father. My father was a doctor. He was in general practice. 
He was one, um, there weren't a lot of doctors in our town back then. He was just one of few doctors. Yeah, well respected. Well respected. My mother, my mother knew. That was awful to realize that she knew. Because the mother is the person who's supposed to take care of you to right. keep you safe, and she didn't. Why did she do that, do you think? In retrospect, I think she did it because she was a doctor's wife, and she wanted to keep the status. Mm -hmm. And she wanted also to be seen as a good mother. And so we were always neat and clean and well-behaved, and we got good mm -hmm. grades. So she could consider herself a good mother. She really did it. I mean, obviously she had more money married to a doctor, too. Mm -hmm. um, this was long enough ago that there wasn't a guarantee of child support like there is now. So her finances would have changed. So in a way, she pimped you. Yes, my mother pimped me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. In, in a sense, you were a survivor of human trafficking, but it was your mother mm -hmm. who made you available to your father. Right. And every time he came home we, from work, we would always have to run to him and give him a big hug and say, Daddy! Why didn't you tell anyone about the abuse? I, I mean, I get asked, like, well, why didn't you tell someone when you were a child? I did tell someone when I was about six. Who did you tell? I don't remember. But the story got back to one of my two parents, and they realized that they would have to do something to silence me. Dad made me... He made me do something. He made me eat something that I thought was poisonous, and I thought he would. I thought he was killing me. I thought my father was killing me. And your father's a physician, right? Yeah, he so is. So he would know whether or not that would kill you. Yeah, he would. But at age six, I didn't know. You thought it was going to kill you. I did. And I was awfully surprised to wake up in the morning because I thought he was going to die, but I woke up. But I was unsure that I thought I might die the next day. It took me a couple of days before I realized that I was going to live. Yeah. And it did silence you. And was that when you started... Was, what, was that when you started hiding those that knowledge of it from yourself? Yeah. That is because I could never talk about it again. I could never yeah. think about it. So anytime I thought about it, I would have to push it away. I mm -hmm. would just say, forget it. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book, Miss America by Day, 11 years after a newspaper reporter in Denver learned that my father had come into my room from the time I was five until I was 18. It was a secret so traumatic that I had blocked it from myself. That's very difficult for people to understand that you can repress 13 years of the nights of your life. But how could I remember? How could I get up and go to school every day and get A's and be in the choir and be on the ski team if I knew what I was going home to at night and there was no one to help me and there was no way to get out of there. I had to block it, which I did. And that's why you forget, that's why repressed memories happen. Mm -hmm. Because little kids are so vulnerable, they need their adult caregivers to survive. So in order to process that, in order to stay and not die, and not actually die, you forget, right? So you just kind of compartmentalize and you, it's amazing that the human body can do that. It's brilliant. It's yeah, it's Incredible. a survival mechanism. Yeah. The betrayal trauma theory was developed by Dr. Jennifer Fried, an author and memory researcher. When children are abused by their caregiver, they may dissociate and lose conscious knowledge of the abuse in order to maintain the needed relationship. Humans have a very well-developed attachment system. The attachment system works in both the infant and in the caregiver. We've got a, a reciprocal relationship in the sense that both the caregiver and the um, infant are giving each other reinforcement for this relationship. And the infant has to do that because this is an extremely resource expensive relationship for the caregiver. So imagine that baby detecting some mistreatment 
and trying to respond in the way an empowered person would. That baby's probably risking his or her life because the caregiver might withdraw. So it's very core of trauma is the whole notion, that our brain scan showed it, is the, uh, the verbal language center of the brain gets knocked out when people become extremely upset. Dr. Bezel van der Kolk is a neuroscientist, psychiatrist, and world-renowned expert on trauma. His research and the research of many others confirms what mental health professionals already knew. Trauma has long-lasting impacts on the body. Dr. van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, explains trauma in a way that is easy to understand. It was published in 2014 and has been on the New York Science bestseller list ever since. From the very first moment I started to see traumatized people, the issue of people not remembering or just seeing images, just having feelings, was very prominent. I, I wrote about it the moment I started to write about Vietnam veterans that these memories were really very different from the memories of the movie you saw yesterday. Um, and that's what's really fascinating, is that um, the language center of the brain shuts down, all that memory stuff becomes complicated. And, um, and that memory of trauma is different. And what became very clear is that if you're not allowed to talk about the trauma, or you're not allowed to help, for people to help to make sense out of being dumbfounded, or as Shakespeare says, struck with speechless terror, then the memory sort of goes away, but your body keeps reacting because your body knows. The research of Dr. Fried and Dr. Van der Kolk resonate with me because I am a survivor of childhood trauma. I had the gift of delayed recall. I don't know how I would have survived my childhood without it. If someone had asked me before I was 37 years old, were you abused as a child? I would have said no. I have an aunt and four cousins with memories similar to mine. In 1993, my aunt told my parents that she had been molested as a child. My parents didn't believe her. They said, we just won't see her anymore. We think she's crazy. I was shocked about the abuse, of course, but also about the way my parents treated my aunt. They had always been so close to her. I went to see my aunt. She told me that the abuse went back to my great great grandparents. She didn't tell me I had been molested, but soon my own memories surfaced. I remembered family gatherings where there were multiple child victims. When I remembered being abused at the same time as a cousin, I'd call that cousin. My cousins always confirmed my memories. So my memories as they came up, even and I was in diapers, so, and I'm pretty sure I was out of diapers by two, knowing the situation. So I was in diapers. And so, yes, the memories, when my memory surfaced, it was all through sort of visceral sensory experience. And then as soon as I started to be able to, and I, and I couldn't speak, but, but that even happened in later memories. Part of my speech was inhibited. And we know that happens when people experience traumatic memory. So... I would typically get more of a visual and, and a sensory memory, and then I would have to kind of find the language after the fact to be able to define it. So this part of the brain that's involved in just keeping your body alive okay. um, gets very messed up. So almost every time it is people, a person has trouble, some trouble with food, right. some trouble with sleeping, right. oftentimes trouble with um, p pooping, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the very elementary foundation mm -hmm. of what makes your body function tends to be affected. Uh, psychologists tend to ignore that because that's sort of what mothers of little babies pay attention to, but mm -hmm. nobody, no mature people pay attention to. But that's where it starts being played out. Um, and so we need to address that. And then the next part of your brain is involved in creating a map of the world. Mm -hmm. and so 
uh, as your brain forms, you don't know anything about what's going out there, and that part of the brain, which you call the limbic system, you can call it any number of things, um, it creates a map of what's going on out there and how I do react to. And it tells you what is safe, what's dangerous, who am I in relationship to my surroundings, where do I go to get the good stuff, what do I avoid to get the bad stuff, and so that is a hardwired map of your brain. Your early experiences determine that map of your brain. So if people beat you up and tell you that you're a rotten kid, that map of the world is, I'm a rotten person, I'm a terrible person, and the world is an unsafe place. Extremely difficult to change. Did it include torture? Yes, it included very severe physical and emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. Is it possible you were victimized in human trafficking? Is it possible that... I don't recall that specifically. I just remember, you know, other, other people that were involved. So it wasn't just my parents, but I could, I could say that there were other people involved. Who sexually abused you? But it wasn't just sexual abuse. It was a lot more complicated than that. There was a lot of other stuff that happened too that was very traumatic, physically traumatic as well. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Human trafficking does not necessarily involve transporting a victim. I was trafficked at my own home. When I was a little girl, we lived way out in the country. One night, close to the trees in front of our house, I was sold to five or six men, one after the other. My parents were my pimps, which means it was familial sex trafficking. In familial trafficking, the victims are controlled by family members who allow them to be exploited in exchange for something of value. Something of value is not always money. I met another survivor who is now a district judge. Judge Robert Lung was exploited by his father in exchange for access to other young victims. His father was a highly successful medical doctor who already had plenty of money. There are many survivors of extreme child abuse who don't know whether they were trafficked. They didn't see something of value exchange hands, but I did. I saw my mother take the money from the men. I couldn't imagine how that could have been for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to imagine a mother doing that to their child. I mean, moms, you think about them, they're supposed to protect the kids no matter what, so putting them in situations like that, you, it's something you don't even want to have to think about. I can't even imagine, like, my mom doing something like that. It, it, it just makes me sick to think about it. I've never even heard of a woman pimp. The dad usually traffics the child. That's, I mean, on the movies and television or stories, that's usually what I've seen. Right. Yeah. I know someone who was trafficked by her mother. And I, I don't think that it's actually as uncommon as people think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, think about Ghislaine Maxwell or think about women who run brothels. Who had not heard of a female pimp before. Uh, I was actually sex trafficked and pimped by a female relative for many years. And she was just a young, beautiful woman and no one could comprehend that she was, you know, selling children for sex. I was never protected from her. Uh, the man went to jail and uh, during my interview, I kept telling them that the woman had been participating and that she knew and that she was keeping me there and um, they actually laughed because it was so unbelievable to them that a female relative could do that. How old were you? Uh, eight or nine years old. And did your female relative have access to you after that? Yes. Yeah, I was trafficked again and there was another thing that happened. Um, so after the court case and everything, she had taken me to a photo shoot. I believe it was in a basement or something. Um, and I believe she was trying to make child pornography out of me. I was already so traumatized that I couldn't uh, perform whatever they had requested. Uh, I would just like freeze and just look really uncomfortable. 
and they got really mad at me for not being able to do what they wanted as kind of a, a punishment. Um, my female relative had cut all my hair off and dyed it this really hideous shade of, uh, of orange, like kind of yellow or orange, just to try to, you know, like humiliate me for, um, you know, causing trouble, like, you know, getting someone put in jail and not being able to perform anymore. It was part of a punishment. Um, so I was sent to live with my grandmother and was told it was just this huge, like, you're so awful, I'm just sending you away. So she lives in a little uh, Inuit village in Alaska. At the time, it was less than 400 people. When I landed, yeah, the whole village had thrown me a party. She really took good care of me. She taught me how to cook. She was just really warm and loving, and I think she was the first um, person that had ever treated me like a, like a real child. What's your life like now? It's really good, actually. Um, so I'm married and I have a really good husband. I'm a hairstylist and I own my own business, so I have you know a little haircutting studio. What did your female relative do for a living? She worked in a photo lab. Um, and I suspect that's where she would print child porn. Now I wonder if everything you did to me, you did on camera so you could make child pornography which I don't even know what you did with. It wasn't like you and my dad were in poverty or anything. You chose it. I remember you addressing the envelopes and putting pictures of me in them. My parents were never apprehended because I don't have continuous memory of the abuse. I remembered my abuse as an adult after I was no longer dependent on my abusive parents. My memories are called recovered memories. I have five relatives who can confirm my memories, but their memories are recovered memories also. None of us have continuous memories of the abuse. I couldn't turn my parents into the police or even sue them in civil court because the courts wouldn't accept testimony based on recovered memories alone. If recovered memories are not accepted in court, all an abuser has to do is traumatize a child so severely that that child can't possibly remember the abuse. Laws concerning recovered memories need to change and statutes of limitations need to be lifted so that as an adult, survivors can say, I remember my abuse. I don't want the perpetrator to hurt another child. I demand justice. You demanded yes. justice. I did. Yeah. And the law that allowed you to... Was passed in 1988 in Washington State. It extended the statute of limitations so that after I recalled, I had another three years. And it was very, very hard to do because I knew I would get some negative comments from the neighborhood and from family. But I didn't so much, so much as I expected. 22 state legislatures changed the statute of limitations so that you can, not from the time that the abuse occurred, but from the time the memory came back. Mm -hmm. Well, bullshit memories that come back like that. I won the lawsuit, yeah. So the judge believed you? Right, the judge believed me. And the case was corroborated, so. So how was your case corroborated? Well, I had a sister who always remembered, and I had a father <laughs> who said it's not sexual abuse if a father makes his daughter touch his penis. Well, actually it is, it's a crime. Yeah, and he, he said that in a deposition. Yeah, he did, yeah. The judge read something that your mother wrote. She wrote a letter to my sister. The letter indicated that she knew her, her husband molested her kids, that she knew. Lynn Crook is a survivor who successfully sued her parents in civil court. Her father, a physician, and her mother, a homemaker, hired experts from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation to discredit Lynn. 
The Falls Memory Syndrome Foundation was founded in 1992 with the goal of proving that recovered memories are false. The false, the name, False Memory Syndrome yeah. Foundation is, they're saying like, well, you can tell me all your opinion or like anything that's your experience, but I'm just gonna say it's not true. It's like a direct kind of, fuck you. Most members of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation have adult children who accuse them of incest. So you've done a lot of research on the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. I have, yeah. I've written two articles now, the book's coming out. I presented publicly in New York, so yeah, I'm doing a lot of work on this. According to the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, one in four women and one in six men were sexually abused as children. It really proves there's a lot of child abuse and that child abuse affects uh, survivors long term. How does False Memory Syndrome Foundation deal with that? Well, in their 1998 newsletter, they called it sloppy science. No, they're not people who ha have a real serious take in the science of what's going on here. They're an advocacy group mm -hmm. for people who, for reasons of their own, and mm -hmm. you figure out what it is, need to deny that incest is real. In 2014, I started making my first personal documentary in an effort to determine the validity of my recovered memories. I am now completely confident my memories are true. This is partly because I had the courage to sit across from people who didn't believe me. Several of my interviews were with leaders of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Dr. Lauren Pancras, a psychologist, was on the FMSF board. All I'm suggesting is, maybe your memories are correct, maybe your memories are wrong. But if they're wrong, it will take you a while to undo them, to mm -hmm. begin to unravel mm -hmm. them and to say, mm -hmm. oh, maybe they weren't quite right. Maybe mm -hmm. these were memories that are actually not true. There were things that happened to me in my mind more than it happened to me in my body. Mm -hmm. So all I'm asking is, you know, keep that idea open. Yeah. I ha and. One thing I did was the whole month of December, I read only literature that was um, with the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. I could see that I was getting less defensive. And but, that's why you're making yeah. this movie. Yeah, <laughs> but, but one thing when I was reading that, I wanted to ask you, some of that, some of the, what I was reading, one thing was saying like, a young child who's under age two or under age three um, will never remember any abuse and if they are abused, won't be affected by it. Is that what you think? A child under two really doesn't have memories of anything that happened. Anything that, doesn't, that isn't painful, the child, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt the child. I mean, it may be morally wrong to touch a child who's under two. It may be obnoxious, it may be, it, that's a terrible thing to do, and society says no. But if you think about it, it doesn't, it doesn't damage the child. It's, it's wrong, but the child's not damaged by it unless it's physically hurt. Physically injured or physically hurt? Physically injured or hurt, well, unless what the if, child cries. If the child cries, then would that affect the child later? So far as we know, uh, children who have been, who have been physically abused, any way abused, they don't remember that. And it doesn't seem to have any later effect on them. So that's kind of good news for my sons wanting to find babysitters for their kids because their kids are oldest is two. And so even if their kids are beat up a little bit at the babysitter, it's not going to affect them um, and unless there's an injury. And moreover, we know that most abuse of children under two, most real sexual abuse that occurs, has to do with touching, usually not penetration. It's usually not very violent. It's not violent at all. It's usually more curiosity, exploration. 
You think a reason someone would fondle a one-year-old is curiosity? I think that's usually what people think. Curious. So someone who would want to touch a one-year-old's vagina, does that for curiosity? Well, that would be one motivation. And what would they be curious about? What would an adult be curious about about a one year? I, I don't get it. That's, that's why it's deviant. Yeah, but you and think it wouldn't uncommon. hurt them? Uh, stroking the vagina of a two-year-old child, uh, 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 an unrelated male stroking a child for curiosity for any other reason. For sexual reasons for sexual and having reasons. an orgasm when the child's there would not affect the child. That child wouldn't remember that. For example, if the child saw, if a two-year-old child saw their parents murdered, they wouldn't remember that. That would be a terrible thing to observe for a two-year-old child, but they wouldn't remember it and therefore wouldn't be affected by it. That's what I believe. Because first of all, I don't know murder is out of it is wrong. They don't know. They can't determine right and wrong when you're two years old. The mind has to be developed. You have to have language to be able to understand things. Language is very important in understanding. But does that mean that you could really abuse a one or two year old? And they wouldn't even probably know it. Since the beginning of time, good mothers have known the younger the child, the more gentle you need to be. Most clinicians believe that the abuse of a young child is at least as damaging as the abuse of a child of another age. I traveled to Salt Lake City to attend a conference about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. There I met Dr. Susie Wyatt, a respected child psychiatrist. I was told that no matter how much a child under the age of three is abused, it won't affect him because he won't remember. Wow. Um... I have to say, I'm aghast hearing that. Um, do we have specific proof about memory for any of us, even good memory? No, we don't have any specific proof. What the concern is, is if perpetrators hear people say, doesn't necessarily hurt the kid, there'll be more perpetrators using that as an excuse. There's something called non-declarative memory and um, non-declarative memory is the memory we don't have words for. But at an, a deep, um, rudimentary, guttural level, we have memory. And I would put forth that it's those people who have been so traumatized, have been so emotionally damaged at a young age, who are at the most risk for having the long-term outcomes with, um, um, with the ACEs studies. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is sometimes referred to as the ACEs study. I have worked actually with a number of people who have um, sustained very, very significant abuse histories. Um, my clinical expertise is in um, child psychiatry, um, general psychiatry, and also addiction medicine. When, um, when my residents rotate through their, um, their rotation on addiction medicine for adolescents, um, I tell them this is not an addiction rotation really, this is a rotation to learn about trauma. You have to know trauma to know addiction because if you think about it, if you break it down to basic principles, who seeks out something to numb out? It's people who don't want to have a memory of something. And trauma is so primed for addiction. Um, I think there's a very rich neurobiology that we're beginning to understand that we're really going to have proof of why there's such a strong correlation there. but. Um, I'm not saying every single person who, who is an addict of one sort or another has trauma, but the correlation is exceptionally high. Again, as a child psychiatrist, and what I have observed clinically, working even with really young kids, is how, how devastated they are at an emotional level when they have been exposed to any kinds of significant trauma. I. 
I, I, I really am in disbelief about what, what you just told me there, that, that there is a belief as such. I work as a mental health specialist for a school district, K through 12. I do mental health assessments, so a full three hour mental health assessment with the family members, parents, if they'll come, and the child. So I do have background in history. So if there's extreme trauma, I know about it. And sometimes they're high profile cases, including sex trafficking, as well as children who have been abused before the age of one. Anybody who says that abuse doesn't affect somebody before the age of three, I, I can't understand that. Did you have a good mother? She loved and cared for me up until the moment she took her life when I was about three years old which is interesting you said three years old and that not affecting you because uh, previous to the age of three, I have some of the most crystal clear, fond memories of her. My mother was active in the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. I saw her on, in a TV program once. Uh, it was an FMS meeting and she and my father were sitting there in the front row. She looks very, she looked very interested. My father looked uncomfortable. Pam Fried and her husband Peter co-founded the False Memory Syndrome Foundation just 15 months after their adult daughter recovered memories of paternal incest. I flew to Philadelphia to interview Pam Fried because I thought she would be the best person to challenge my beliefs about my childhood. It was my first interview for my first documentary and I was nervous. Well, something's gotten you questioning, and you really are yeah. following very I, yeah, carefully. Yeah. I think that's and an I appreciate, admirable. Oh, thank you. I just was really surprised. I pick up the phone on a call, and you answer your phone. I'm like, can I come? And you're like, that's OK. And I mean, it's the name I've always associated with you know, False Memory Syndrome Foundation. When I decided to do this, the film Am I Crazy, um, I decided to really, truly, honestly explore could my memories not be true? And as you know, I mean, I've had them, it was, it's been 20 or 21 years that, since I remembered. So, uh, but I wanted to talk to the best people about it. And I, I thought, yeah, that's you and then whoever you recommend. Supposing you find out or come to the conclusion that it's probable or certainly possible that your memories are false. In fact, you might already be at the point where you say it's possible since that's why you're searching. But would you then be willing to show your documentary in the search? Oh, absolutely. Well, you're pretty strong and you're very open. Many people, when they make a decision that their memories probably were false, lose a lot of self-confidence. They tell us that they feel kind of silly, that they had these beliefs in the, in the first oh, place. Oh, yeah, I could see how and it could be real embarrassing. But, and that's why, that, embarrassing, that's the but word. But I just think there's more to life than, I mean, I'm unwilling to live my life based on being embarrassed. So you know? you're open to that. You oh, really are open to that oh, possibility. absolutely. I have another question. Yes. Your aunt seems to have been influential in your life. She seems to have played a really strong role in your belief. No, I mean, I just didn't know her. I mean, I, I hadn't, she hadn't, I just hadn't been around her for, you know, some time. She and my mom were roommates in college, and they were both home ec majors. Some of the closeness I felt to my aunt was because the way she reminded me of my mom. Well, you know that I can't give you any final answers. I don't know anything right. about your memories or anybody yeah. else's. Um, but we have had 25 years now where we've been talking with lots of people who've had questions uh -huh. uh, and other people who've had questions about their children, all kinds of right. things. Tell about when did your organization start? And we started in 1992. We were a bunch of families that got together. We were one of them because um, 
uh, our daughter recovered memories and um, that was how the foundation started. Can I ask you, I mean, cause you believe your daughter wasn't molested. Can you tell me what process you went to determine that that was not true? Oh my goodness. Uh, one is so overwhelmed when an accusation like that comes and a very credible person that mm -hmm. I've always believed. So I withheld judgment and started to do research. And in honesty, the most, in our particular case, the most telling uh, issue was the fact that she refused to talk. She refused to meet. She refused to communicate, to discuss things as, as people do. That's a lie. She didn't refuse to talk. No, she, they talked for a long time. Who is Pam Fried's daughter? Pam Fried's daughter is Jennifer Fried. She's um, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. It's Dr. Jennifer Fried. Dr. Jennifer Fried was a professor at the University of Oregon when she remembered sexual abuse by her father. It's well documented that there was extensive communication between Jennifer and her parents after she disclosed to them. She broke contact only after her mother sent an article to Jennifer's professional colleagues at the University of Oregon describing Jennifer as dramatic, cruel, and temporarily deranged, all while Jennifer was up for promotion. Even so, Jennifer received the promotion and remained at the University of Oregon for 30 years. Dr. Jennifer Fried is now at Stanford. Along with her team of social scientists, she researches a strategy used by perpetrators. It is known by the acronym DARVO, which stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And in DARVO, what happens is there is an aggressive denial followed with an attack on the credibility of the person making the claim. It might take the form of questioning their mental abilities or their motivations, saying you're a liar or you have, you're crazy. And then reverse victim and offender is when the person who's being held accountable assumes the victim role and says, I'm the victim here. And in our, more recently, we've been researching this systematically in the laboratory, and we have found that, unfortunately, DARVO seems to work. And um, it's, you could say it's like a perpetrator strategy. And the ways we've so far found it works is it's associated with victim self-blame. So if people get DARVO'd, they're more likely to blame themselves. And it's also associated with third party judgments. So third parties who are exposed to DARVO responses versus non-DARVO responses are more likely to doubt the victim and assume the perpetrator must have some, some uh, basis for making the claims. The, the good news is preliminary research in our lab also suggests that education about DARVO helps uh, mitigate a bit that people who learn about DARVO are less likely to, um, to stop believing the victim. Dr. Jennifer Fried's sister has disclosed childhood sexual abuse by their father. At some point, if physical evidence is lacking, if there is no physical evidence for something, at some point, many people want to just step back and say, whoa, I think I need to rethink this. It's interesting to me. You listen to the False Memory Foundation. As if they were the authority. And that's sort of the odd thing that victims sometimes do. They go to people who are highly suspect to get their approval. It's like kids who go to their abusive parents. Well, thank you so, so well, much. You've been so generous in so many ways. Well, thank you for making the trip. Thank you for being open to questioning. So, thank you. I, I hope we meet again. Thank but you. I know we'll be in touch.
Thank you so because much. Have, Thank you for your help. I really appreciate it. I, I really, really do. Thank you. I just thank you. You know, it's kind of like, can't see my mom. So anyway, thank you. I just needed to go back and see my mama again. And that's what it represented to me. I would not do it again, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Then I went back to see her a second time and I thought, oh, I did all the things she said to do. I did all the research. So I went back like, okay, I've done this all now. And it felt like she had no more use for me. Second interview with FMSF co-founder, Pam Pride. Sounds to me like you're quite convinced and I don't know why you're continuing. You found your answer, you're sure. You know, I think why I did, I realized what it was, was that this whole journey had to do with my mother. Four years after I remembered being sexually abused by her, my mother died. Seven years after her death, I started imagining her as a little girl angel. I wrote a short story. In it, everyone goes to heaven, but your age depends on your spiritual maturity, which is why my mother was so young. She was not mature. I was able to visualize my mother looking down on me, recognizing how much she had hurt me, and sobbing. This was a way I used art to help me heal. On an unconscious level, I knew that this fictional story was not going to provide me the restoration I needed. I made desperate attempts to find a mother. If I'm honest with myself, I must admit I had an irrational hope that I could convince Pam Fried my memories are true. Then she would believe her own daughter and dismantle her harmful organization. Why did FMSF start? It was in response to all the lawsuits that were coming up. Um, people were suing their parents and they needed a defense. They found it, false memories. Since it began, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation has acted to discredit and silence the voices of survivors, including former Miss America, Marilyn Vanderveer. Hey, let's join Miss Colorado, Marilyn Van Derber, at the Hammond organ. At that time, Miss America was very, very highly regarded. The reason I interviewed Eleanor is because I was told that she knew Marilyn Vanderbilt well. She said she had information about Marilyn's memories not being true. Dr. Pancras says that you're the one, I have an email from him saying that you're the one who referred him to Eleanor Goldstein. He was looking for information about the case. Email from Dr. Pancras, FMSF board member. I corresponded with Eleanor Goldstein, who went to the University of Colorado with Marilyn Vanderbeer and knew her well. No one close to this case believes that the sister confirmed their recovered memories. Would that be Eleanor? Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else to ask besides Eleanor about it? Do Why don't you ask Eleanor? Did she confide in, I mean, you weren't close, right? No, but you, just Did, like somebody sitting next to you in school every day for a year. Yeah. Or a semester, or whatever yeah. it was. But she, okay, so your information was the same as anyone else's would have been. I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to go back to college. And people would say to me, do you really think you can go back and just be a junior in college? That wasn't the problem. The problem was how people reacted to me. I went to the football game and people were lining up for my autograph. I get to interview former Miss America, Marilyn Vanderbeer. Hello. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you. I am old, so I can remember when the Miss America pageant was the most popular TV show. That you was are old. Yeah, yeah, that was before the Super Bowl. And now, Miss America of 1958, there is the runway. There are your subjects. Please to join them.
Did you know Eleanor Goldstein in college? I did not know Eleanor Goldstein in college. So you don't, you don't really know anything about her memory? Absolutely not. Marilyn has a... What's story. your evidence that the sister always remembered? Yeah. Newspaper what is your reporters. evidence of... Yeah, of newspaper reporters who have interviewed her. She's been interviewed multiple times. Her sister has been interviewed multiple times. Do you have corroboration? I do. As soon as my memories came up, I was 24. One of the first things I did was to get on planes and go talk to my sisters. My eldest sister, Gwen, who lived in Kansas City, when she knew what I was going to say, she just turned ghost white and she said, I thought I was the only one. I never should have left you. It's my fault. That would be a corroborated case. If you say so, I'll take your word for it. I'm quite hesitant because um, in my working with children, I have had children who were abused um, in class. And to have an honest student who was, who under, who experienced what Marilyn claimed that she had experienced night after night, and to still be so successful in school is, is difficult, but maybe she did. Do you think any honor students are incest survivors? Yes, but not night after night. Do you think the only honor students are incest survivors who are only incest I'm survivors? Not, I, I don't want to try to talk about this anymore since I wasn't there, and by and large, I don't know whether somebody experienced things or not. If I have read or have reason to believe that there's an alternative explanation, uh, then I tend to go in that direction. Your daughter Jennifer has said publicly that about the new dancing in front of your husband, she and another little girl, and I think last time I was here you were saying it was when she was about nine or so. Mm -hmm. Do you think your husband has sexual feelings toward her? No. Why? why? But, he's somebody that I've lived with for ever so many years. I knew him growing up. Um, I never saw any indication. But even the new dancing, I mean... He, never, it's, he didn't ask to have that. That was something that they decided to do. He didn't want them to feel traumatized by coming down too hard on them. But just to say, you know, go into your room or, I mean, did you talk to her about it later when you knew that had happened? I didn't even know about it for quite a while. Oh, she, he didn't tell you for a while after that? Well, I was working. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation closed its doors in 2019. They should. Have you met Dr. Jennifer Fry? Yes, I have. It was just an honor to be in her presence. She's completely credible and brilliant. She has been at the forefront. Right, and she was forced to be in the forefront, which is so unfair. She was, as I was, both of us. When the newspaper reporter came forward with a story, I called my sister Gwen in San Francisco and I said, if you want to go public with this, do it in California because we're never going to get off the front pages in Denver. The next morning, the third day, it was on the front page of the paper again with my sister's story and my picture. I waited until our daughter awakened. She had just come home from her sophomore year in college. She woke up and I said to Larry and Jennifer, I have to get out of here. I have to go. So we put on our sweats and we went to the high school track. We were jogging around the track and the woman with her two dogs came. We always said hello. She stopped me. And she said, Marilyn, we're so proud of what you're doing. And I'm so grateful. Your sister came forward this morning. I had been upset about that. And I said, really, why? And she said, because yesterday, on our most popular radio talk show, people were calling in and saying, why should we believe her? Now that your sister has come forward, they will have to believe you. I was stunned. 
I looked at her and I said, if people are not going to believe, 53-year-old me, then who is going to believe a child? What's the importance of the mother's reaction? In our midlife, we need to go back and heal the past. And I was 48 when I went to talk to my mother, and I was just sobbing uncontrollably. And when she finally knew what I was saying, and my father had been dead for a year, she said, I don't believe you. It's in your fantasy. And I thought, if my mother won't believe me when I'm 48, I certainly knew as a child she would never have stood up, never. She won't even stand up for me now with my father dead. I needed my mother. I needed my mother at age 48 to say, I am so sorry to her death at age 88. She just did not choose that path. Did your mother know? Yes. I was older than 10 because it was in our new house. My mother always dressed elegantly for bed and she wore shoes that are called mules. They have a hard heel. My father was in my room. It was 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and we didn't hear her coming down the long hallway. But when she started down the linoleum steps, I had the maid's quarters, and there were three linoleum steps. First, she very slowly went down on the first step, and then very slowly the second step. Everything stopped, and then the third step. All she had to do was take six more steps to be at my bedroom door. I knew finally, finally, it would be over. And we heard her step again, only she was going back up the steps. And I knew she would never walk through that door. Did my mother know? 13 years, my mother knew. What would your mother have done if someone had done that to you? She might have killed them. <laughs> um, she was wonderful and protective and defended us. Like any time she thought anyone was, you know, just crossing a line or anything like that. And, and she could be very angry. And if she felt that her children were in danger, she, she would stop at nothing to protect us. There are mothers who honestly don't know about the abuse. Alex Hinton, was 20 years old when she remembered paternal incest. She told her mother and her mother believed her. Clara Hinton went to the police and turned in her pedophile husband. Did you know your husband was abusing children? I did not know. He, he um, gave no, no, no clues. I mean, nothing of the sort. He was respectful, he was um, even what you would call somewhat backward um, in that he was never, he, he never told dirty jokes, he never teased in that way, he never did anything, you know, that would even hint towards anything that was sexual, especially with children, not yeah. at all. That's the way my father was and Lynn is saying that's the way your father was, huh? Yeah, okay. Yep. And then when your daughter Alex told you she had been sexually abused, did you believe her? Yes, totally, completely. I had a good relationship with Alex. Um, we were always close. And well, I, I just saw no reason why she would say that if it wasn't true. Who turned your husband in? Jimmy and I went to the police. Our situation was that my dad was just such a highly skilled sexual offender mm -hmm. that we had no idea because he was so incredibly good at covering his tracks. If it had only been Alex and they were recovered memories, would she have been able, would he have been prosecuted for that? No. We were told by the detective she said, I can't open an investigation based on Alex's testimony alone. And she said, but she said, I can guarantee you that he's abusing victims right now. You know, at the time he was babysitting um, very young children and having sleepovers at his, at his apartment. And, you know, the detective said, um, that's enough for me to call him in for questioning. The detective called me up and she said, your dad just left the police station. And she said, it, it is really bad. 
she said, I, I've been uh, doing this for many years. And she said, this is one of the worst cases, if not the worst case that I've ever had. And as soon as I hung up, uh, my dad called and my heart, I mean, it just sank. And I thought, oh man, you know, because I knew he was going to call to confide in me um, because him and I were really close. You know, I've always had a very close relationship with him. He said, oh, by the way, just so that you know what you're dealing with when I, uh, when I do go to jail, uh, here are the names of my victims. And he just started rattling off. I mean, just like I'm talking to you right now. That he wasn't crying. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't saying, my God, what have I done? It was just, oh, by the way, so that you know what you're dealing with when I go to prison, here are the names of my victims. And then after he rattled off the names, he said, you know, I got to tell you. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful that I got caught. And you should be too, because Eden was going to be my next victim. And my heart, I mean, absolutely sank. And I knew, based on what the detective had told me, that his age of preference when he began the abuse uh, was age three. And my daughter was 15 months old at the time of his arrest. Eden Hinton is 11 years old now. She has never been abused. By speaking out, survivors can protect children. Does that mean all survivors should go public? No. Disclosing is a personal decision with many considerations. I honor survivors who choose not to speak out and I respect their privacy. Concerns about retaliation by her mother, Eleanor, kept Stacy Charlotte from going public until now. Do you remember when I told you I'd be interviewing Eleanor? Yes, I do. Do you remember what you told me? Well, I told you she had a daughter. She has a daughter who's recalled. Yeah. yeah with recovered memories. And yeah. so then I already had this interview scheduled, but Eleanor's daughter, Stacy, had never gone public. So I tried to get Eleanor to tell me about her daughter. Uh, and did she? Not really. <laughs> Have there been problems with your children or? Me? Yeah. My children? I don't Between think. you and your children. I don't think more so than anybody else. I mean, do you have children? Did do, they always yeah. say everything was wonderful in your family? No, but no. We, we would always talk about it. You know, if they thought something wasn't right, then we'd talk mm -hmm. through it. Have your children ever been out of contact with you? Not really. No. In reality, Eleanor's daughter chose to have no contact with her for many years. And one of my sons was out of contact with me for three years. Oh my. I thought it was going to kill me. It was horrible, but it was just... Um, Why was he out of contact? Well, um, my first marriage involved some domestic violence, some verbal abuse, and I think he needed, at the time of the divorce, to just have some space. I think all my sons owe me is to be good people. Well, because that's he, a bunch of BS if you ask me. Life. No, and you have a life too. It was okay for him to do what he needed to do to have a good selfish, life. Selfish, 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 selfish. Being a parent isn't, it's not an equal but thing. But what about being a son? What about being a son, been caring about my mother who stayed up at night, who changed my dirty diapers, who nursed me, who went through childbirth with me? And he should damn well appreciate it. Have you forgiven him? No and I never will. She's acting out today, she's hurting people today. She would continue to hurt me, could she? She would, no, I, there's, I don't see a need. I'm 60 years old now. At any time up to this point in my life, had Eleanor come to me and said, I get, I get it what happened, I know this was a problem. Any kind of ownership, any kind of acknowledgement would help me dramatically, even to this day. How is your relationship with your daughter different than your relationship with your mother? Well, it's totally different. Um, it's just night and day different. I, I, I would, I don't abuse my daughter as far as, you know, that's not, so it's just totally different. I have respect for Corinne, a great deal of respect. I would never degrade Corinne or I wouldn't want to, it wouldn't even occur to me. So it's just totally different. 
I would, I, I can't imagine doing anything deliberately to hurt Corinne. Doesn't mean that I haven't done things that hurt, out of ignorance and you know, and self moments of self, being self-centered or whatever. But it's not the norm. It's not what defines our relationship. And the things that I have done that I am aware of that I, that have hurt Corinne, I ache over even today. I still feel it. It's like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And Corinne probably forgot about it by oh, now. Yeah. But there's so I mean, there, she... <laughs> there are moments where it's like, oh my God, I can't. Yeah. So. Do you so think you had time. a good mother? Yes, I think I am extremely lucky, um, and I feel very lucky to have the mother, to have you as a mom. How is your relationship with your daughter different than the relationship you had with your mother? Oh my! <laughs> oh goodness! I I had no relationship with my mother. Her denial and her lack of any compassion. Uh, oh goodness! My daughter and I are so close. One of the reasons we have that closeness is because. I stopped shutting her out. When she was 13, I disclosed to her. I believed she was going to say, you know what, I, I, I really don't want you as my mom. And instead, she started crying for me, held me, and said, why would you have any shame, Mom? You didn't do anything wrong. I will never forget those words. My daughter is someone that I can see her parenting now. I've moved closer to her, and I can see her parenting her kids. And she's someone that I wish I would have had as a mom yeah. because she sets such a good example. She yeah. actually has fun with her kids. Yeah. She trusts them. They trust her. Who picked out this house? My daughter did. Where does she live? Point to her house. <laughs> it's right down. <laughs> okay. It's just right down there. Okay. It's just down the hill. It's just about half a minute walk. How many grandkids do you have? I have seven grandkids. And you love them so much. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen you with your grandkids. Yeah. yeah. I uh, I had a different experience, of course, with my own grandfather, my mom's father. I really felt like he loved me, and I I really, even as a very young child, had the sense that my parents didn't. So when he would come to visit, those were like really special times. It's hard to get over being daddy's little girl or grandpa's little girl yeah. or someone's little girl, even if it's hard because you feel so special. Yeah, and that kind of feeling special meant a lot more to my mom than having a normal relationship with me. When he would come, many times, enough times that it didn't seem unusual to me, when my dad would be at work, my mom would sit me down at the dining table and give me chocolate chip cookie dough to eat so I wouldn't disturb my mother and her father. My mother and her father would go into the master bedroom and have sex. When I disclose molestation by my mother, people often ask, do you think she might have been abused as a child too? I know for a fact she was. And what started in childhood never ended. You would never have chosen to get counseling no matter what was offered to you because you wanted to stay your daddy's little girl. You come up from Texas in his fancy car with air conditioning. No one up here had ever seen air conditioning in a car. He loved attention. You could tell I needed attention. And you felt special when he came because you and him would go into your bedroom and have sex. My dad at work and you having sex with your father. And then, when your dad, when he brought me in, you were protective of me. You were jealous of me. You were jealous. You were jealous of me my whole life. I flew a 
across the country interviewing people who remind me of my deceased mother, but I didn't find the healing I needed until I went to Germany. I was asked to show my first documentary in Leipzig, Germany. While there, I met Dr. Ralph Boyd, a psychologist. Hello, I'm glad you're here. He and his wife, Irina, developed the protocol and designed the equipment for a unique style of body-oriented psychotherapy. Other therapeutic concepts go by the brain. Body-oriented work is for the childlike um, parts more important than working with the brain, to working by talking. You know? Yeah. And uh, they need real experiences, real. Mm -hmm. Only when it is real, they get it. Look for a symbol for the small Mary. Of that small Mary, you do the job today. This chair is for the small Mary. You are the big adult. Please say some empathic words. I'm here to make sure your mother doesn't hurt you anymore. We have here symbols and you should look for special uh, dangerous person you had in your life. Yeah? You suffer from them until today. You look, should look for symbols and uh, put them here in the ground. This is the perpetrator corner. And you look what symbol or around or the, some shares, whatever you like. But for each person, what is very important, you look for a symbol, the mother and the father is leaning on her back. Or else he's... Uh, preventing her from moving. I'm not sure if this is my father or her father. Please decide either either. My maternal grandfather uh, was named... What was the name, yes? Bob Park. Bob Park. Yeah. Oh, you hurt me. You hurt my mother's... You didn't let her grow up. Mm -hmm. and oh, me. more. You have it, power. Yes. Yes. I. No, you accuse them. Yes. Marianne Ramsey, yes. you were never, ever as grown up mm -hmm. as I've been for a long time. Yes. I don't need you as a mother. So, Big Mary. What do you think in the moment? For today, it was a big job. Yes. And you stop now? Yes. And that, okay. You go back to the small Mary and say what you feel. I didn't realize how much anger I would get mm -hmm. out today. I'm yes. glad I got it out of my body. Yes. And I... And you showed some feelings of revenge, whatever. Yes. That was necessary for the, to the perpetrators. Yes. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I got some of the anger out of my body, which leaves room for the joy mm -hmm. that we should have. Maybe sometimes you have to repeat something of that settings, but you know now the way, and it is like it is. But in the moment, you, you both did a big job. Now we come to the third part. You need a real support with a mother-like body. I think you had your favorite. Do you like this? Yes. Again, okay. I feel, uh, I feel just real connected from the adult me and the child me. Now when I say mama, it will be my internal Your internal, right, my yes, internal your mother. own internal mother. And this is a real solution. I came to tell you goodbye. It's time for me to have a good mother and I can be that for myself. Thank God I can be that for myself. And it's really ooh, an exciting thing to think about in life. 
being my own mother. I'm never coming here again. I'm never coming back to the grave. Every survivor of abuse needs to find their own path to recovery. I didn't have a good mother, so what did I do? I became the mother I'd always needed. Could I have done that had I never experienced love as a child? I don't think so. My childhood heroes couldn't rescue me, but they saved my life so that I could grow up and rescue myself. Did you ever feel completely cherished as a child? If so, I want you to take a moment right now and think about that feeling. Close your eyes if you'd like. Know that you deserve to be loved, especially if you are one of the one in four women or one in six men who were sexually abused as a child. After you've taken some time to heal, Consider being a hero to a child. There's lots of ways to do that. I am a sponsor for a number of Alateens. I'm a recovering uh, drug addict and alcoholic. I've been in the community for 39 years. I take my recovery into, uh, I've taken my recovery into uh, holding facilities for teenagers, felons between 12 and 18 years old, and I've carried the message of recovery to them. I'm doing a radio show right now and it, uh, it's a community of people throughout the world because we now have internet radio now and uh, helping people who don't feel like they fit in or whatever. I've got some audience members like, uh, you know, gay and lesbian kids in Brazil. I'm actually in college right now to be a teacher for children, like for elementary schoolers. I also want to be a teacher so I can be a safe place for kids that are having a hard time at home. I'm in the application process of becoming a child abuse special advocate, um, and I'd be advocating for foster children. I was abused throughout my childhood in the state of Washington. My husband and I are now licensed by the state of Washington as foster parents. I am having fun being a foster mom. Even if you can't rescue a child, you can save that child's life. Although most of the audience members were actors, their comments reflect their real-life experiences and beliefs. Did you have a good mother? Uh, she, um, she had her own childhood trauma, so she did her best and she worked really hard to provide me and my sister with a childhood that she didn't have. And she loved us so much, just unconditionally. She's gone now, and so I, I have really positive memories of her. We, we talk every day, like literally, like every day. She worked really hard. She was a working mom, so she tried her best to make sure that all our needs were taken care of. She was disabled, but um, she was still an amazing mom. I had a really great mom, um, both my mom and my dad. My parents were very good role models. Like, I'm a big advocate for anybody, anybody in need, especially like children, like I like to make sure that they have what they need at the schools. And I know that the schools can't afford to, to have a lot of the, the nice books, so I buy books in bulk and I, I donate them. It's not that I didn't have a good mother or a bad mother, it's just that she just wasn't there. So my mom used to work a lot and stuff, leave us home alone since we were little kids. And uh, on the weekends, she would party all the time. Did you have a childhood hero? I did. I was very fortunate um, enough to be spend a lot of time with my four grandparents. I didn't have a dad, and um, my grandparents, uh, they wanted my mom to have support, so they built a new house just for us to live with them. Growing up, my dad wasn't really around all the time. He, I only really got to see him in the summers, so I always looked up to my oldest brother, Trey. He was about like 14 years older than me. And uh, he was always there, taught me how to drive, and uh, 
He always took me camping. For information about becoming a foster parent, contact the National Foster Parent Association. Do you, I have to own a house in order to be a foster parent? Because uh, I live in an apartment. Oh, that's fine. I know a foster parent who lives in a two-bedroom apartment, and she actually has two boys about the same age, not from the same family, and they share a room, and then she has her bedroom. So that would work perfectly well. Do children in foster care ever go back to their original parents? The goal of foster care is for the children to go back to their biological parents. Sometimes that's not possible. Black children are overrepresented in the foster care system. Many are adoptable. My wife and I, we have two daughters, and um, we've been talking about possibly adopting a boy, you know, because it's a little lopsided in the house right now, and we would <laughs> like to help the world and get a boy. <laughs>